I were to utter the word extinction, please raise your hands if the first images that come to your mind are those of big animals like polar bears and tigers and orangutans. That's quite a few of you. Now, I thought the same till a few years ago when I first learned that an apple is a kind of a rose. Now, what's that got to do with extinction of species? I'll tell you in a moment. This is Malassiversi, the wild ancestor of all apple varieties, and it's a member of the rose family. The Malassiversi is thought to have, been, have evolved millions of years ago, but it still exists in the mountains of Kazakhstan, Central Asia, but barely. The area is being rapidly cleared due to urbanization and agriculture. At the end of the 19th century, 7,000 varieties of apple, which are descendants of the species, were cultivated in the United States. Now only 15 varieties are grown commercially. So there we are. It's not just big animals, small animals, insects, and wild plants which are becoming extinct, but also plants that human beings have cultivated for food over the last 10,000 years. In the last 100 years alone, we've lost 75% of crop genetic variety. Every six hours, we're losing a unique vegetable variety. So why should we be concerned about this loss of food plant diversity? And what can we do about it? That's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Now, it's not just the number of cultivars or varieties within a particular crop that's disappearing. It's also the diversity between crops, which means we're depending for more and more of our food on fewer and fewer crops. Did you know that only three crops, rice, corn, and wheat, provide for 60% of the world's calories and proteins? Only 12 crops and five animal species provide for three-fourths of the food consumed by humanity. Now, why was I shocked when I first learned this? Certainly because so many things are disappearing. But also, in my own ignorance, of the fact that there was so much diversity in the first place. I've been a city girl all my life, and the only food I knew, except, of course, before I became an urban food grower three years ago, was stuff that came out of supermarkets. So I researched and looked around for plant varieties. And what I found was really amazing. Now, time allows me only to share a few examples. This is a picture that went viral on Facebook earlier this year. It's called the glass gem corn. You heard me right. It is a variety of corn. It is for real, and it is edible. I got in touch with a small Colorado-based family-owned company called Seeds Trust, which lovingly preserves these seeds. They got them from a half Cherokee, Oklahoma farmer, now in his 80s, called Carl Barnes. And he had a special knack for developing translucent and bright colors in corn. There are over 20,000 varieties of corn in Mexico and Central America. Mexico is thought to be the birthplace of corn 7,000 years ago. But the black, red, and multicolored varieties are coming under increasing threat in the markets from yellow and white corn and also in the fields from genetically modified corn. This is the antithesis, the direct opposite of diversity, monoculture, or the mega cultivation of one and only one crop. Mass produce, homogenous, and mind-numbingly identical is driven by one mantra, economics, that of increasing yield and reducing costs. But it comes at a huge cost to the environment and to people. There's a huge myth that if we have to feed 9 billion people by 2050, we've got to keep producing more and more of the same stuff. Now, the world already produces 20% more calories than it needs. So it's not about making enough food, but how we distribute the food. One third of the food the world produces is wasted. 40% of the corn produced in the United States is for ethanol. 5% of all food grains in the world is for biofuel. So we need to be asking, why are we feeding cars instead of people? 35% of all food grains in the world are fed to livestock. So whenever you have a, a burger or a chicken sandwich, you're actually eating, eating soya and corn, because that's what cows and corn chicken eat these days. According to the United Nations, 
If we were to feed people directly instead of feeding livestock, we could feed an additional 3.5 billion people. So in grain-fed, industrially farmed meat and dairy are big killers of biodiversity. What corn, soya, and canola are to the US, oil palm is to the Southeast Asian tropics. I'm sure if you've taken off in a plane from Singapore, this is what you would have seen within minutes as you fly over Malaysia. It's impossible to miss the little star-like patterns of dark green oil palm trees arranged in neat rows stretching all the way to the horizon. One and only one species of oil palm, the Elaeus guinensis, originally from Africa, dominates what used to be tropical rainforest. Malaysia and Indonesia alone produce 90% of the world's palm oil. Imagine if we were to travel in time into the future and meet our descendants 100 or even 50 years from now. I'm sure they'd ask us, you burned down the lungs of the earth and cooked the planet hotter for us to sweat it out? You burned down these vibrant and dense rainforests throbbing with hundreds of thousands of species. And for what? For soap and shampoo and chocolates and biscuits and cosmetics and toothpaste? What the heck were you thinking? Now, I'm not sure we'd be able to look them in the eye and give them an answer. One in 10 products in supermarkets contain palm oil. So can we do away with these everyday use products? Not completely, but if we tried really hard, we could look for palm oil free alternatives. But what would really help greatly is to reduce our overall consumption of these mass produced, highly processed foods, which are anyways full of unhealthy salts and sugars and fats and additives. So much of our stereotypes are formed by the images we see around us and through media. Now, why does Bugs Bunny always munch orange carrots? Why are Halloween pumpkins, or the pumpkins in children's fairy tales, always orange? Carrots are thought to have originated in Afghanistan 5,000 years ago and were more likely purple, white, or black. And blue and pink pumpkins do exist. If not in fantasy, then definitely in reality. These pictures of pumpkins were sent in by my friend, my classmate, who now lives in Berkeley, California, from a local farmer's market. So why is plant, food plant diversity so important? Is it just about pretty pictures? The Andes region of South America is home to thousands of cultivars of potato. And potato farming was brought by the Spaniards to Europe in the 16th century. But the cultivation of just one variety of potato, the lumpa, led to the spread of a fungus called the Irish blight. And that completely destroyed potato crops. And that caused the great Irish famine in 1845 and led to the death of a million people and a further migration of a million to America. Now, one and a half centuries later, a similar threat exists with huge monocultures in the world, which are highly vulnerable to pests and fungus. So guess what we do? We spray on them very toxic chemicals, and we even genetically engineer crops, such as soya and corn, to resist these chemicals. And we're not even sure how safe these are for human consumption, because no long-term trials have been done on humans. Besides, they kill all the good stuff, like the soil microorganisms the bees and the pollinators, which are so essential for a healthy ecosystem. I'm standing here at Navdanya, an organic farm and seed saving organization in India. Around me are 450 varieties of rice, just a fraction of the 200,000 varieties of rice cultivated in the world. On the left is Prakash Singh Raghuvanshi, whom I featured on my website. He's a near blind organic farmer, and he grows an amazing variety of rice and wheat, which he calls Kudrat for nature and Karishma for miracle in Hindi. And, they, and that's because they adapt very well to extremes of climate, temperature, and rainfall. On the right are the Karan Hill people of Thailand who, form, who adopt a, a form of shifting cultivation. 
And every season, they grow new varieties of rice to adapt to changes in soil type, elevation, and temperature. Now, farmers like Karl Barnes, Raghuvanshi, and the current people all tell us that every cultivar and every variety has a story to tell. And it's so sad that as we lose these varieties, we're losing the results of years and centuries of experimentation. We're losing the collective wisdom of millions of small-scale farmers over 10,000 years of agricultural history. It's like having a library of valuable books and genetic information that's being handed down to us carefully. And this library is nature's and humankind's insurance against pests, climate change, and water scarcity. And this library is going up in flames. And what's more, the keys to this library are being held increasingly in the hands of very few people and very few large companies who will not part with what used to be free knowledge without farmers paying a hefty fee for chemicals and seeds. There was a huge uproar over the introduction of genetically engineered brinjal in India. There are over, India is home to over 2,000 varieties of brinjal, or aubergine, or eggplant, as you may call them. And each variety comes with a unique texture, flavor, and a cooking style. The oldest reference to the brinjal is in a 4th century BC text called Ettutugai in Tamil, which is my mother tongue. And in it is described a lovely curry, a recipe of a lovely curry, with roasted brinjal, peppercorn, ginger, curry leaves, and mustard. Now, for varieties to survive, we need farmers. But we also need a vibrant culinary tradition. And I can't stress the importance, stress enough the importance of a home-cooked meal with fresh ingredients, rather than outsourcing food preparation permanently to restaurants and factories which use highly processed and synthetic ingredients, which pretend to look and taste and smell like food. So what can we city folk do to help preserve food plant diversity? I am going to offer three ideas out of the many that we can do to help. First, grow food and save seeds. Now, if ever you come across an interesting and tasty veggie or fruit variety, please harvest the seeds and plant them somewhere. One of the most wonderful acts of random kindness you can do is to plant something, especially if the fruits of your thoughtfulness are going to be enjoyed one day by your community, or perhaps even by people or someone that you may never get to meet. There's so much you can grow in small spaces and backyards and balconies. You can even start a community garden in common areas of your estate. There are about 400 community, ga community gardens in Singapore, and the numbers are growing. And they're a great way to grow food, save, and share seeds. My friend, Zach Denfield, from an organization called Deno Genomic Gastronomy, asks, what if we could encourage each child what if we could even make it compulsory for each child in school to become a guardian of a seed variety? Now that's food for thought. Revive forgotten foods. Now I'm sure if you talk to your grandma, she would have had some food, fruits, veggie, herb, or fruit that, that aren't to be seen anymore. See if you can dig up that knowledge and revive it. I was in Dehradun, India last year, and the hill women taught us how to use millets. Now, in Asia, we've become far too dependent on grains like wheat and rice. We need to diversify our plate. Foods like millets use far less resources to produce, are far more nutritious than white polished rice, and also provide a source of income to small-scale farmers. And I'm going to share with you two of my favorite plants, which I think need to come out of obscurity. And I would love to see these grow along the streets of Singapore. The first is the wing bean. It's a popular Malay vegetable, which the New York Times, by the way, calls a potent weapon against malnutrition. I call it a 24 by 7 single species supermarket because you can eat the leaves, the pods, the flowers, as well as the roots. And it's a powerhouse of minerals, vitamins, and proteins. And these are from my terrace garden. The second is the moringa, the drumstick tree, which is well known in India. 
It's known as the miracle tree because it grows so well, even on poor soils. And it's packed with nutrients. The leaves are better than any multivitamin tablets. They contain six times the amount of vitamin C as compared to oranges, four times the amount of calcium and twice the protein as compared to milk, thrice the amount of potassium as compared to bananas, and thrice the amount of iron as compared to almonds. And studies in Africa have shown that these two have been very effective in combating malnutrition. So here's my humble challenge to each one of you sitting here or watching this. Can each one of you, in your lifetime, revive at least one veggie or fruit or herb that you don't commonly see in supermarkets, either by growing it or by cooking or eating it? Humanity's ability to feed itself may well depend on it. No pressure. <laughs> Mindful eating. There's a saying in Hindi, Jaisa an, Vesa man. As is the food, so is the thought. The food that we eat every day contributes directly to the state and health of our mind and bodies. Can we become more intentional and conscious about the food that we put on our plates? Can we ponder about where food comes from, how it's made, what kind of a present, and what kind of a future it supports? Whenever we choose to eat industrially farm meat and dairy, highly refined sugars and drinks, highly processed foods with a complicated series of synthetic ingredients, we're voting for a monoculture future where there's likely to be food scarcity. Whenever we eat, whenever we choose to eat fresh veggies, fresh local and preferably organically grown veggies and fruits, and a diversity of grains and beans, we're voting for a future of variety where there's likely to be abundance. In Singapore, no matter whether you're Chinese or Malay or Indian or any other nationality, there's one word we all understand. And that word is makan, or the Malay word for food. There's this wonderful poster at Ground Up Initiative, which is a local grassroots effort to promote food growing in Singapore. And it says, makan is our most intimate interaction with Earth. And that interaction comes with a sacred responsibility that we choose our foods in a way that preserve, preserves the soil, preserves the air and water, and preserves the precious diversity that has been handed down to us by our ancestors and millions of farmers for us to pass on to future generations. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.